Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Would It Work 2018 and to the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. Uh, it's great to be here. This is my alma mater. I, I'm a graduate of the BIARC program, class of 1996, when we were in a different building, just a f uh, block and a half from here. Uh, so it's really exciting to be back at the University of Toronto and, and reconnect with some of my old professors, uh, meet some of the new students. It's fantastic to be here. So welcome to Wood at Work 2018. This is our fourth annual gathering of people from around the world and very close by who are exploring how wood connects people. Um, this is about connection to each other, to forests. Um, this is about linking the rapidly urbanizing world uh, to a world where nature is supported and revered. Um, Wood connects traditional skills and ideas about meaningful work to the latest technologies, philosophies, networks of contemporary life. These are just a few of the kinds of connections that Wood offers us. And we're going to hear about these and many more both this evening and throughout the day tomorrow. Um, some of you are here w as registered Wood at Work participants for the program. We've had a, an an amazing bus tour today of five mass timber building projects in the GTA area. Um, we're so excited to have our speaker tonight, who I'll introduce shortly. And then um, tomorrow we have 25 speakers um, doing short talks and panels exploring different dimensions of forests, trees, wood, architecture, engineering, urbanization, etc. So for those of you that are joining or would like to join, um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming, for those who are uh, committed to the, the whole program. Um, there's been many that have worked really hard to make this happen. Uh, special thanks to my uh, co-founder of Wood at Work and wife, Dr. Sarah Wilson, who's a forest geographer. Um, so coming from the architecture side and the forest side, um, that sort of marriage has partly um, given birth to the collaborations that we want to see happen at this event. Um, I want to take uh, a moment to thank our sponsors who have taken a very significant interest in Wood at Work and this year in particular. I want to thank our Walnut sponsors, the Carpenters Union Local 27, um, and Aaron who is here representing, and I believe Mike York as well. Uh, it's just incredible to have um, labor thinking innovatively and how Wood makes uh, basically wood connecting uh, the, the long-standing trades to contemporary architecture and construction. Uh, to Woodworks Ontario, advocating for the use of wood um, in construction. To the Mass Timber Institute, the new Mass Timber Institute of Ontario. Uh, to our CEDAR sponsors, the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. Uh, to the University of Toronto Faculty of Forestry. To Woodmiser Canada, I don't know if any of you saw the portable sawmill when they came in. Uh, Dorian Lavallee is uh, the, the Sawyer and sales rep for Woodmiser. He's going to be with us all day tomorrow demonstrating that sawmill. You're going to see some of the products of that tonight at the reception. Um, to our Pine sponsors, EACOM, Forest Ontario, um, and Structure Fusion and HDR, uh, Radiant City Millwork, and the Birds and the Beans Coffee Company, who is supplying our coffee tomorrow. So these are the, these are the sponsors who have contributed um, financially and in other ways. Um, and then I want to uh, I, I want to talk about the um, or introduce the acknowledgement for the land that the university sits on. This is a uh, traditional acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most re recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Co Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the, me today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. This is such an appropriate um, acknowledgement given the conversations that we're having and what we're learning uh, today more than ever. So uh, with that said, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker who 
for many of us needs no introduction. Michael Green is the founder of Michael Green Architecture. Um, founded it in 2012 with a focus on advanced wood buildings that support community health and the environment. Michael is known to many of us uh, for his research, leadership, and advocacy in promoting the use of wood in the built environment, uh, lecturing internationally on the subject. In addition to Michael Green Architecture, Michael founded the nonprofit school um, Design Build Research to focus on progressive architecture research, education, and innovation. Um, based in Vancouver, BC, Michael and his team contribute to meaningful, sustainable change in building through innovation in construction, sciences, and design. Michael is a fellow of the Royal Institute, Architectural Institute of Canada, and has been awarded with uh, numerous awards, the North America's most pre prestigious awards, including the um, two of the RAIC Innovation Awards, three Governor General's Medals, um, and numerous North American Wood Design Awards and International Interior Design Awards. In 2014, Michael received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of British Columbia, um, and we are just very excited to hear about Michael's latest ideas and work under the title, Evolutions and Solutions, Michael Green Architecture and Katera's Exploration Systems and Typologies in Mass Timber. Please welcome Michael Green. Thank you. Thanks, Hey everybody. Um, so fingers crossed, my presentation about five minutes ago, all the slides didn't look very good, so hopefully we've got this dialed, but um, bear with me. Um, I, I'm going to talk for like 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, and, and, then, uh, and then we're going to have a chat, right? So that, that's the plan, and then there'll be some question time as well with all of you, so hopefully you have them. Um, so my firm is uh, in Vancouver. Um, we had a little office in Brooklyn, for a research office briefly, and we have an office in Portland that nobody sits in, so I, I kind of have two fake offices in a way, but um, mostly we're in Vancouver, and this is us moving into our space six years ago, so we're just a little six-year-old firm, actually, and it's been a hell of a ride. We, um, we sort of um, had a previous firm that, um, that I sort of split in two and, and started this firm, and that's us moving our CLT desk into the space. I like starting there. Um, <clears throat> with this idea that we would focus completely on wood because it's something that's very dear to me for a whole bunch of reasons, from sustainability and climate to um, the beauty of it and the, the craftsmanship of working with it to um, really what I'm going to talk about today, which is, uh, is how it fits into a kind of future of really advanced thinking in, in the way buildings are put together. And that kind of leads me to some of you may or may not have heard of this company, Katera. Um, but recently, this spring, I decided to sell the eco economic interests of my firm to this company, Katera, which was a big, scary decision to do. Um, but my firm itself, I still run it. My team is exactly the same. Nothing actually changes about what we do other than the fact that we have this really interesting new engine to push innovation that we're really um, enjoying, and that's this partner, Katera. Um, who have, are a U.S.-based company founded by Michael Marks, who used to be CEO at Tesla, comes from high tech. The entire senior management team comes from high tech and looked at this industry that, of, uh, of designing and building and said, boy, this is really strange. This industry seems archaic. Maybe we can tweak it. And um, so in a way, it's uh, Katera is part of what I think is like Airbnb and Uber and other sort of disruptors. So I'll talk a bit more about Katera as we go on, but first I'll, I'll sort of touch a little bit about our firm and how we ended up sort of linking up with Katera and why Wood became the intersection between um, both companies and what we do. So about for the last six years, seven years now, um, about half of what we do is really custom bespoke stuff and about half of what we do has become real typological type work. And what we found is that no matter how sort of custom, every project became a tool for us to kind of learn a new material, a new way of approaching a problem, a new way of um, uh, building off-site. Somehow it was going to be a, a, a tool to inform us about some aspect of construction that we thought would then inform a much more um, global approach to systemic sort of, or systemic approach to, to, to um, um, you know, building things in a much more um, clever, sustainable, and affordable way. Um, the mission of affordability and sustainability kind of runs through what we do, um, with the goal ultimately of not only obviously dealing with 
the climate and the, and, the, and the planet, but also making architecture much more affordable for more people in more places, not just North America, and especially for me in the developing world, which we're interested in. So um, I'm just gonna scroll you through bespoke projects, which have this huge range of types, and you, know, you can kind of imagine um, all the different ones. Um, and now for some reason I'm out of order with my slides, but then these will be the typological ones that we're doing, which are, again, these highly repetitive building types, which I'm gonna come to at the end here. Holy cow, my slides are completely out of order. Um, and blurry. We may go to the PDF, where's our IT guy? <laughs> Hold on everyone, because that's super blurry still. So the screen, everything's clear, and for some reason on the screen, we're like even on my screen here, we're super blurry. Yeah, we'll find out in a second. Oh, where does it say? Sorry, everybody, and I'll, I'll blabber for a second here while we get this. Huge fear here, hold on. You're gonna look at blurry slides until we get the right one on. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some, some images here and then hopefully you can see proper clearer ones in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so over the last six years, we've been doing all these different types of timber projects. And one of the things we became really interested in is the idea that, that um, that it wasn't just CLT, cross-laminated timber, which probably a lot of you have now heard about, as people on the tour today got to see, but um, it was really this idea of a family of materials called mass timber panels. And so if you, if you don't know already, mass timber panels are products that are made super huge, really wide, really long, really thick, that allow us to really reinvent the scale of how buildings are built. And for, for the last 20 years or so, mass timber panels of, or CLT, cross-laminated timber, has become a really big conversation in Central Europe, mostly Austria. Um, more recently, in the last 10 years, it's become a big conversation in Canada because we've had producers here in Canada. Didn't work. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, now what? I've never had this problem before. You sure it's not a screen resolution thing that we can just fix on this thing? Okay. It just, you know, drink more. It'll look great. <laughs> um, okay, so bear with me. I apologize because images are everything, and when they're blurry, it's a drag. But um, So we got interested in these mass timber panels, and I'm going to show you projects of each of these different materials so you get a sense of what they are. But we, CLT, cross-laminate timber, became this big conversation in Europe, but we didn't have it here when we were starting, it didn't, wasn't a product made here. And so we started as a firm working with alternative products like laminated veneer lumber, LVL, or laminated strand lumber, LSL, or nail laminated timber, or now dowel laminated timber. Um, these all became these other kinds of systems. And so um, it became really interesting for us to learn how these materials could be used in different applications. And we still love them all and use them all in different for different projects. But cross-laminated timber, which is what this building's made out of, has become probably the most, um, as I say, common material to use for us on bigger and bigger projects. Um, so this is the Wood Innovation Design Center in, in Prince George, BC. It was the first tall wood building in North America. And it came out of a book I wrote called The Case for Tall Wood Buildings, which was sort of the story of why. Why should we do this? And the why was about that we need to build with materials that are grown by the power of the sun and that, that um, store carbon instead of um, uh, have huge carbon footprints like concrete and steel. And the story was about sort of that we should bring those wood materials, natural materials, into urban environments, and that meant build, building bigger buildings. Um, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that side of things, the sort of case for tall wood buildings, which often I speak about, just because I want to get into actually the technologies that I think are going to inform, no matter what scale or type building you're doing in the future, what that might look like. So this building was a huge education for us, and has triggered thankfully for us, a, a real sort of movement towards a lot of these kinds of buildings. This is, a, you know, this is the University of Northern British Columbia uses this building. That's what it looks like on the inside of an all mass timber building. Um, and it's all timber. It's so blurry. I'm so bummed. I'm so sorry. Um, 
my screen looks great. If we could all just huddle around my screen for a minute, you can. Um, so um, this project was, um, you know, it was just an education. And I'm, you'll see um, what it's informed in a moment for other kinds of projects. And I'm just going to kind of keep moving. The building's actually entirely timber after we left the ground. So the elevator, the stair cores, it's only eight stories tall. It's a, hundred, a 30 meter tall building. Um, tomorrow I'm in Boston, so I'll do 100 feet tomorrow morning when I say it. Um, but it's, it's not that tall. But we looked at it how you could build it much higher. In Prince George, they just didn't need taller, so we didn't do that. Um, this is City Hall in North Vancouver. Um, this is made out of laminated strand lumber. So imagine little pieces of wood glued together like oriented strand board, if you know that material, made into thick panels that are huge. And so this was um, a, an early example of, for us of learning how to prefabricate panels, large scale format mass timber. So the roof is panels that were 30 feet, it's an imperial building, 30 feet by 12 feet that were lifted into place. And that ceiling's actually a structural cord. It's actually the, like the tension cord in a very shallow truss. Um, <clears throat> and, and for us, again, was sort of education in how we would start to build bigger and bigger buildings using these mass timber materials. The next one, I'm going to go quick through these because there's, there's a, a very different story I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, this is laminated um, veneer lumber. So this is like giant plywood. In this case, they take it, it's like a really thick giant plywood, can come up to, in Finland, they make it 85 feet long and, and 10 feet wide. Here, they make it 64 feet long. Um, we chop it up into little pieces, typically, and put it into light wood frame buildings, but you can actually buy it if you twist their arm. You can get them to sell you these huge panels. Now, this panel is actually taking, you can see the stripes of the, of the end grain of like a plywood. They take it and re-glue it together horizontally, so they cut these big slabs and then re-glue them so you can get different thicknesses. It's a beautiful material. And we just did this interior of a mezzanine structure of an existing building. Um, just to, again, show that there's a diff there are these, all these different materials. Um, this is Royal McDonald House in British Columbia. It serves 73 families. Um, I always wish I could tell the story about this project more than just the wood, because it's a really, really beautiful, important um, function. But, um, but the, the big impact here is it's entirely made of CLT. So typically buildings like this are not made in wood, but now they can be. So I, I think of these buildings as being legacy buildings and how we have to move university campuses to building entirely in CLT. And just because they're used to stone or brick or other materials doesn't mean that they can't be thinking of the substrate of the building being made in something other than concrete or concrete block or steel. And so we developed a system where we tilt up these big CLT walls. Because it's not super tall, we use these like sets of wood for the floors. That's what it looked like going up. And then we cover it all. The neighbors fell in love with it like this, and they were totally bummed when I started covering it with brick. But, um, but it's a legacy project that'll last a long time for a charity, so it was important that it was durable on the outside. Um, a lot of the CLT is covered up, but here in the living room, you can see the thickness. Those layers up here, I have no idea how to point. Is this a pointer? I don't want to hit this. this it's, given my technology problems here, I won't risk that. Um, anyway, the CLT, you can kind of see that strip of wood. That's a huge thick panel of, of cross laminated timber. So this, um, you know, this idea that there are all these different timber products is, is if you're a designer in the room uh, or a builder in the room, this is the land of opportunity. It's a really interesting place because whereas steel and concrete are highly predictable materials in many respects, we've been designing with them for 100 years, so many of these materials are new. They're quite fascinating to actually get into. And if you're an architecture student in the room or, or an architect, the, one of the things I've become a huge believer in is this idea that you know, the, the icons of the last century, the Mises and Lu Kahn and, <coughs> sorry, others, were, became masters of a material. They became the voices of, you know, in the case of Mises, what's the most honest expression of steel? Or in the case of Corbusier, looking at concrete. Or, late, you know, or Nervi and others that followed in concrete. Looking at the material to create the architecture that followed, right? And the entire modernist movement was built out of the material of structure. 
And I often argue that Mies in about the you know, 40s and 50s had figured out steel and the, you know, with the Seagram buildings and others had figured out how to use as little steel as possible to make this honest, beautiful expression of architecture. And then since, there, since then, since that mid-century period, we haven't, as, as a profession, had new materials to explore in structure. And so we've kind of been spinning our wheels. We've been just making crazy shapes and forms, I think because we're bored or asleep at the wheel, but we're not really engaging with a structure. And so if you're interested in kind of what the evolution of the profession and architecture is about, I think wood is this next stage. We are at the beginning of a massive shift towards natural materials, carbon sequestering materials, materials that actually engage the human spirit and make a difference in the quality of people's learning ability and health um, impact, all things that wood does. We as a profession should be taking that material and defining what it looks like and feels like in the future. So that's, you know, these are all different threads of enthusiasm that come around the material. So this is an airport um, I did with my previous partner, Steve McFarlane, years ago all in timber. And we as a practice do, as I say, these bespoke projects that are just, you know, much smaller projects. This is all um, prefabricated, pre-panelized light wood frame construction in Vancouver. And then weird projects like this one for Dr. Dre, the musician, um, for a music studio on top of a mountain in Utah that we're hoping to build in CLT with him. It's a pretty crazy site on a ski hill. Or this one on the summit of Whistler. This is Harmony, if you've ever been skiing on Wesley, this is top of Harmony, it's a 250 seat restaurant we're gonna build. Um, or this little guy, this is um, on the waterfront, this is a little dock building where they repair boats in Vancouver. Um, these little projects in every case are these opportunities for us to, to work in wood and, um, and you can barely see the wood in this project, but it's, it's um, you know, the timber is just amazing. Um, one of the reasons we, we sort of have found is that we've been applying these wood solutions, the mass timber solutions to all different applications. And like those high mountain ones, we, we do those because on Whistler, on the summer of Whistler, you get three months to build, that's it. You got snow the rest of the time. So one of the, and you, you'll see this in a moment as I get into the detail of Katerra in particular, one of the huge benefits is changing the speed of how, uh, how you build a building. And wood structures go together very, very quickly. Right, a really quick way to think about it is if you're building in concrete, the process of building a concrete wall on a big tall building is the crane picks up a form, puts it on one side of the wall, the, picks up another form, puts the two end caps on the wall, then brings in a stack of rebar, a bunch of guys tie rebar into the side of that wall, then the concrete form is put on and tied on the other side, then the concrete truck pours the wall, then the crane picks up one form and then the other form, the other two forms, and that's the process of building a concrete wall, right? The same process in, in a mass timber project is the crane picks up the CLT project, guys take cordless drills, they zip it into the ground and you move on. That's the difference, right? That's how you think about the difference in construction timeline on this, which equals money, which equals opportunity. Anywhere you save on a project, you turn it into something that actually matters to the people that use the project. So what's happened for us is we have projects like this one. This is um, the Peruvik Center in, on Baffin Island. Um, and it allows us to, to go like, much like building on top of a mountain when you're building on Baffin Island. You have, everything comes by boat, very expensive, very hard to get there. You wanna prefabricate everything you can. And so we're building this in CLT for that reason. We also have projects um, elsewhere around the world. This is a project in northern Sweden, all um, who obviously Nordic countries are really interested in the future of, of mass timber. Um, so weirdly enough, they hired Canadians to come help. So we've been working on this. It's a really cool program, of mixture of arts and culture and sports all together. So things like a public library and a huge arena and public swimming pools and, and um, you kind of, get a sense of it, but it's, we're, we're actually doing spans that are up to uh, 40 meter spans entirely in CLT, and we're building these box, what we call caissons, so it's like a box structure, sometimes as big as the floor here, and I can walk inside these, and that's how we're doing these super long spans. Those are those box structures you see in the roof to do these huge spans. Um, so in every application, as I said in the beginning, where even though these are sort of our bespoke collection of projects, there's sort of little lesson plugged into each one of what we think then is gonna inform the second half of this talk. 
Um, this is a project called T3. This is a nail laminated um, building um, built in Minneapolis. This is the, pro the photo where you get a better sense of the wood in the building. Um, it's a developer project, super inexpensive, and, to, and you know, in a kind of neighborhood of really old warehouse buildings, so we wanted the architecture just to be a really good, solid, quiet, neighborly building, which is, so that's what it is. It's just a really nice, quiet building. But to my surprise, when we did this, I thought, yeah, it's fun. It's like a, you know, nice seven-story wood building. It's pretty big for a wood, it's actually the biggest wood building built in the United States in, in modern times. But, um, but I didn't think much about it, to be honest with you. And, and to my surprise, this building has turned into the sort of hit of our practice right now and has created a wave where the tech sector in Silicon Valley want to build these. And, um, you know, we've got developers all over the world now that want to build these, and this has become a typology. And this was a turning point for us. This was a first, it was an office building that now we realize can become a kit of parts that we can start to develop um, because it's quite straightforward um, into something um, that really will be quite different in urban environments to create offices like this. Um, with a lot of CLT prefabricated panels built off site. Everything has a kind of rendering quality to it because of the blurriness. Oh, that's just brutal, that one. Um, so, wow. Somebody tweeting about my photos right now. Um, so this is Paris. That, you can see the Eiffel Tower at the top there. This is a project that's all timber. Um, we're only doing two of the towers. King Okuma's doing this tall one on the right and Timur his first, so we're working with him on that and then mostly French architects, and we're doing these two, the two towers in the middle, which we feel are kind of the quietest buildings of them all. I, th I think our architecture is, is much too quiet for France, but we have five projects right now in Paris, so we're doing a lot of timber. They love timber there, and it's because after COP21, the, the conference on, on climate change that happened in Paris, France engaged this idea. They realized that not only does the IPCC, the International uh, panel on climate change um, through the United Nations has said that wood building is something that every country should be moving towards in order as part of their checklist of what they can do to make an impact on climate. Um, not only is that the case, but, but France really took it to heart that they had hosted this major climate change um, moment in time and decided that almost everything that's happening now, and, and certainly in Paris and, and cities like Bordeaux and elsewhere, Lyon, <laughs> have become timber based. So these are big buildings. We're doing a lot of big projects there now in timber, and it sort of shows the interest. These are entirely, the tower, everything is timber. So these are um, probably going to be 18 to 20 stories to two towers in timber. Um, pretty simple buildings, residential buildings in this case, mixed use of the ground. So that's ours in the middle there. Um, the other projects were to be timber, but the architects have kind of slowly moved off of it, mostly because of experience. Um, but hopefully it will come back. Um, this is Vancouver, residential, um, up to nine stories. This is New York, Newark, just outside of New York City, definitely not New York City, um, 12 stories. The U.S. Um, building code is changing. This sort of thing on the right here describes the U.S. Building Code. But the U.S. Building Code is changing to allow tall wood buildings up to 20 stories tall in 2021, likely. Um, but they're going to have to cover up all the wood. And so up to 12 stories, you can expose the wood. After, from 12 to 20, you cover up the wood. I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem because, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately, um, ultimately, people want to see the wood in these buildings. The wood's beautiful. And technically, there's no reason to cover it up. The, the, the moment in time we are with regulation and building codes and so forth, this is a highly politicized, highly emotional environment. You would think that building code was based on science and testing and so forth, but um, it's not entirely built on that. And in fact, there's a huge emotional side of it. And people hear wood, and there's just a sort of reaction, well, wood burns. Well, it does, but we can manage it in really practical science-based ways that allow us to build really big buildings. And so our, 
our team are kind of lobbying hard for us not to have to cover up wood, and we're trying to find, even in the U.S., where we're going between 12 and 20 on projects, we're going to try to find ways around this U.S. code, which is currently arbitrary. Same in Canada. You guys should know that the Canadian code's changing about 12 stories coast to coast in 2020. Um, and in places like British Columbia, they're allowing that now. Um, we, can, we can do projects that are already 12 in B.C. In the U.S., we've been able to lobby in places like New Jersey to, um, to actually work ahead of the building code. So there's a, a really, pr in progressive states, California we're working with, Washington, Oregon, um, looks like Utah next, and, and, and New Jersey have all said, we're game, we get it, we understand this, this is important to us, and we can work and allow these bigger buildings to happen in wood. So there are all kinds of systems. I won't spend a lot of time on the systems um, that allow us to do this. And we're just constantly refining systems to figure out how do you conceal the services? How do you, you know, hide sprinklers and ductwork? How does it work? Um, most of our projects now are passive house designs. So this is passive house as an example, big office building, super ultra low energy. Um, almost every project we do now is passive house as a kind of matter of principle for the firm. Um, one of the things that's nice, and I never thought I'd get here professionally, but now that we have enough work, it allows us to call our own terms, which is a game changer. I think tomorrow night, ten, well, I have 10 minutes, apparently. Um, uh, tomorrow night, um, you guys are going to get to hear from Pacquiao um, Architects, and, and I think, to me personally, Pacquiao are doing the finest work in our country. Um, but, but, you know, it'll, it'll be really interesting to hear their perspective on things because they're very bespoke in their, in their work. Um, and, um, and, you know, they're in the position, the same position we are now where you get to choose. And when you choose, for us, we choose passive. So these projects, this is an office building in Washington State, um, use these kinds of systems, including now what we're doing is a lot of, and again, I'm not going to spend time on the details, but we're doing a lot of prefabrication, which is leading to that second piece I talked about. So using CLT, in this case, we developed this two-part envelope system that we can flip around um, that's built basically on the backbone of spanning two floors at once. These are big floors. You get a sense based on the person standing in the window. Um, but it allows us to, again, not just build the structure really quickly, but wrap the structure really quickly and reduce the cost, increase the quality by moving into a factory and away from, from being built on site, um, which are all sort of smart, smart things. We're also doing projects like this, this is in Victoria, um, connected to this heritage building. Um, where we're studying sort of unit typologies in residential buildings to build really fast-built um, residential. This is all um, market or affordable rental is kind of the goal, where we're mixing CLT mass timber floors with light wood frame walls, um, which seems like a really good solution in six-story. So here in Ontario, they, you guys can do six-story. This is another project in, in Victoria with the same kind of concept. Um, and this kind of modular approach. So that kind of does lead us to this sort of issue of typologies and all the different kinds we're looking at. The two first ones, commercial and residential, are our big ones, but we're doing these other types that are much smaller. We've just started a really fun project of mountain cabins and ocean cabins where we're truly doing prefab, <laughs> like the conversation around prefab, if you pick up Dwell Magazine, ends up being every project as a one-off. We're trying to really break that model and truly do it. And we wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for the Katera partnership, which after this set of slides, I'm going to show you. So the other thing that typology has happened for us is that um, Silicon Valley is really engaged in this idea. Um, they realize that um, in places like Silicon Valley or San Francisco, it's so unaffordable to live there. The, um, they need to build housing for their own staff, but also for the firemen and the teachers that can no longer afford to live in those cities. And so they've really embraced the idea that they're going to be builders. So Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft are all going to be building housing in huge volumes and not just in Silicon Valley, but elsewhere. And so we've been working with various tech companies, most of whom I'm not allowed to talk about. But one I can talk about is these guys, which is Sidewalk Labs. And this is here in Toronto. <coughs> So 
Um, I can't show you much for this, but we've basically been working with um, Sidewalk, who you guys probably have heard of, got this notion of a very interesting um, progressive community entirely built in wood that will be the largest wood project in the world by far, with many, many, many towers in wood. And so we've been working with them um, as a kind of master timber architect to, to help them understand various systems and technologies um, that I don't have time to talk about in detail, but um, that deal with issues of what we call these um, loft buildings. So their ideas of how buildings are very flexible to be both residential and office buildings and how do you do that in timber. So we've been working on sort of scenarios and these are really out of date, but they're the only ones I'm allowed to show so far. So there's all kinds of different ways we've been sort of talking about density. We won't be the only architects doing this. Nohad is also working with us on this. Um, and others. Um, but what's cool is the scale of that stuff you just saw, this really dense um, blocks of, of major towers, um, you know, upwards of 30 stories or more. Um, we calculated just using one of these dense blocks with four towers on it that the North American forest grows enough wood to build that block every 100 minutes. So wrap, wrap your head around that. So if you're sitting in the audience going, oh my God, we're not gonna have any more trees ever again, Every 100 minutes, we could build a really dense block um, just based on the growth of the North American forest alone. So forest management, forest process is really, really critical to the success of this. Again, I'm, maybe ask me questions about it if you have, because I, I can't go into it. But let me touch on <coughs> the Katera piece really quickly in the three minutes I have left. <coughs> um, Oh, it doesn't matter, I'm sick, that's the problem. <laughs> this won't go away. Okay, so um, here's an interesting set of stats. So the telecom industry has gone through this, you know, unbelievable change that we're all used to and everybody's got a phone in their pocket. And, um, you know, when I was in university, I sure didn't have a phone in my pocket. Um, the, just out of interest, the telecom industry is about an $800 billion industry. Um, a year. The auto industry obviously has gone through its own massive change in the way that the technology works. And interestingly enough, of course, Ford came up with the assembly line. It's like planted the seeds of effectively what all industry has done for the last century and a bit. Um, but the big change in automotive was it used to be in a car factory until fairly recently, every car running down that assembly line the same door, the same model had to go on. So it was like people putting doors on. And now we use robots so that every model, one can be a truck, the next can be a car because the robot doesn't, no longer cares, right? So the power of robots and, 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 um, and computers and algorithms is really changing all these industries and is barely changing ours, but it's about to change ours in a big way. So out of interest, the telecom industry is 800 billion a year. Um, the, the auto industry is about 900 building, billion. And, and here's what we've been up to. <laughs> um, and people have said, you know, well, yeah, but you know, there's big companies, there's lots of money to make the change that those industries have seen. Of course, you can have disruption, no problem. But that's the amount, $1.2 trillion goes into our industry. It's way bigger than cars, way bigger than, than telecom. And in the United States, the tech sector, which is the biggest tech sector in the world, obviously, with Silicon Valley and elsewhere, is one third per year of the financial size of the construction industry in, in the United States. And yet, this is what, that, that's what we've been doing, right? So in my last minute or two, I'm just gonna touch on the fact that there is a massive change coming. And the change has to be a rethink of everything we do from the process of design the connection of the software tools that we use, the regulatory process of how we do it. One third in, in, in San Francisco, and it's similar in Vancouver, if you look at the cost of buildings, one third is land, one third is the cost of construction, and one third is regulation and taxes. So the Katera company that I keep mentioning, our goal is to reduce the cost of construction by 30% by basically vertically integrating the company, meaning we'll make everything from lights, toilets, faucets, CLT, and building parts, and then construct the building. If we do all those things, we can reduce construction by about 30%. But the 30% impact that we can have by being smarter about construction and design is still only gonna be tackling the one third 
that our industry actually controls of the cost of a home in places like San Francisco or Vancouver, probably Toronto, I bet the same is true here. So we are also, in, with the Katera piece, and the reason I became so interested and invested in, in partnering with them is we're creating new tools for cities to do code reviews, to do permit um, checks. We're, we're basically going to take, you know, roughly our goal is to take about 90% of the human part of, by using algorithms, 90% of the process side of, of building approvals off the table by letting software do the work and AI do the work. We're doing a similar thing with the way we design buildings. We all don't, if you're sitting in the room, you probably don't enjoy drawing bathrooms over and over in a multi-res project. Well, we don't need to do that. We can let computers do a lot of these things. So picking what we do in our profession so that we spend our brain power on the things that really matter and not the things that don't is kind of mission critical for us to reduce the cost of projects, to speed up the return on the project, which means we can reach more people. And better yet, when we can shrink the cost of buildings, through process in, in moving off-site into factories um, instead of building on-site in the pouring rain as we do today. What it means is that we'll have more resources, spend a little more on sustainable solutions, spend a little bit more on the landscape, spend a little bit more on the human qualities of a project or the architecture of the project, or simply make it spend a lot less and make sure more people have a home to live in, which I think is a huge part of it. So last, I know I'm like two minutes over time here, but this is an interesting little stat here. So um, McKinstry did this really interesting study last year, and they talked about seven construction productivity drivers that need to be ch changed and challenged. So rethink design and engineering process, which is what we're talking about. Improved procurement and supply chain. Right now, like when you buy a toilet, it passes through four different, maybe five different companies between the manufacturer and getting it to show up on site. It costs $8 to make the toilet. It costs $120 by the time it's installed and it probably gets charged out to the homeowner $250 by the time it's just the toilet, right? $8 to 250 is a big jump. And it's simply because we as an industry are still working the way we used to 50, 60, 70 years ago. In fact, worse. Uh, infuse digital technology, improve on site execution, rewire the contractual framework, reskill the workforce, and reshape regulatory and raise transparency. So these are all the things that we, as is in our new model with the Katera folks, and what I've become so interested in is it's not just about, for me, how do we solve things in wood? but how do we make sure the extension is that we're actually trying to solve real problems, not just make pretty buildings, but actually solve real problems that impact people. And so through addressing all these things on a wood platform, it's the, it's the process that we've chosen. So the last thing I'll say, and I'll stop, even though I'm more, I can keep going, um, is that Katera is building the largest CLT plant in the world. They raised in the first three years, they've only, they're a three-year-old company, they've raised $3 billion mostly tech money, big tech money. Because the tech sector says this, our industry is broken and architects and contractors aren't fixing it. And we have to, we have to embrace this idea that change is coming, the computers are gonna help, but we have to actually just retool the entire way of thinking. And what Katera realized, and the reason they're building the largest CLT uh, plant in the world, it'll be open this spring, is because wood is the backbone of what they wanna do. Because it's light enough to pick up and move as a prefabricated part, but robust enough that you can actually pick up and move it, it's not flimsy to lift with a crane or put on a truck, it's the perfect balance between strength and weight to finally deliver what we've been talking about for almost a century of the real meaning of prefabrication and off-site construction. Highly accurate, cut by computers, completely um, you know, kitted out with all the mechanical, electrical, and brought to site, assembled fast, dramatically reducing cost, reaching more people. So that's our goal, and I will cede to the conversation part of the evening. So. <laughs> so maybe, I'll, maybe I'll hit some more slides with questions. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and sitting down with you, Michael, and uh, and just chatting for a bit and, and then opening up to this, uh, this room of people to talk about this great work. So thank you so much for, mm -hmm. um, first of all, for all the leadership that you've 
offered. I know um, many people in this room know your, you through your videos, your book, your work. Um, so it's just great to be with you. Michael has to get to another conference um, tonight. So I'm just going to warn everyone that he's going to be basically I'm taking a quick run from the stage. At, I've got uh, a few extra minutes. My plane is late. Oh, yes. I have to be in Boston. Thanks, Porter Airlines. Tonight. Um, great. So um, who would have thought that wood would be the thing that would start to facilitate this kind of transformation? Because as you said, like there's been a kind of dream of prefabrication and um, streamlining and automation for well over 100 years. And to come back to wood as the thing that's actually making that happen. Yeah, it's kind it's of a pretty surprise. wild, right? Yeah. And, and that I always I sometimes get embarrassed at an innovation conference where I, the big innovation that we're talking about is gluing sticks of wood together. And yeah, that's right. It. That's the innovation. But um, um, but it, it speaks to the idea that don't make things complicated. It doesn't have mm. to be. Um, we actually had on the bus a, a PhD, and I'm sure she's here um, in doing wood adhesives. Oh yeah, we talked. So there, that's yeah, uh, we talked. I think I, I think I ruined her day with the concept of dowel lamb, which is if you guys don't know dowel lamb, it's like two by sixes or two by eights kind of set side by side. A dowel run through them like a hole drilled through them. They microwave the drought, dowel, slide it in, and the moisture of the wood swells it up to lock everything in place. No glue. So mass timber without glue. Mass timber without glue. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. There's, there's, it is the playground right now um, for foresters and, and product innovators mm -hmm. and architects and engineers. I think it's an absolute playground right now. So much cool design work to be so done. So much cool stuff, and we're just at the beginning. Um, I'm always interested in, in how leaders got to be where they are um, and, and how their background influenced um, their trajectory. So I, I have to ask you, because I know my background is full of stories that some, where somehow wood um, and the environment just le led me here. So for you, what are some things that, uh, can you trace your interest in wood back to anything in your, uh, where you came from, sure. et yeah. cetera? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, um, well, one thing I always find kind of amusing is that I was born in the Canadian Arctic, so way, way above mm -hmm. tree line, which I always think is kind of interesting. That I, yeah. And when my sister first, she's older than me, but my mom tells the story of arriving for the first time in Winnipeg when she was like four, and she came out of the airport and she pointed at trees and she's like, look, mom, trees. And the people around her were kind of like, where's this kid been? Why does she not know what a tree looks like? Um, the, uh, you know, that's the beginning, but mm -hmm. um, I, I just worked, my grandfather was a historian, but he had a shop in, up in Northern Michigan, and that um, was hugely influential as a kid, just spending time with him. He had a wood lathe, and so we'd go in the woods and find random parts, and we'd go and see what happened when we put him on his lathe, and, you know, I'd smell the air and the sawdust and just fell in love with wood at that time. I worked for Cesar Pelle doing these big concrete mm -hmm. steel buildings, and my first eight years of my career. And as interesting and inspiring as it was, it just didn't, I didn't have any, I didn't feel any heart in it until I went back to wood when I moved back to BC. And uh, then everything changed and wood just became, like I can't imagine why I'd work in anything else. Mm -hmm. So, um, so similar, <clears throat> similar stories of um, my dad, uh, my dad's workshop and a place that I spent a lot of time in that connection to wood. So we're kind of like at this really interesting moment, and it's not, it's a moment, but it's also just kind of a reality of um, where things are moving, that wood is bridging low-tech, high-tech, slowness, speed, um, inefficiency, which we usually think of as a bad thing, but maybe it's not always bad, and high efficiency. Um, how can it be all of these things, and what does that mean, and where are we going with this? So, so because we've become so interested in sort of how digital fabrication is going to allow this huge speeding up of the process, mm -hmm. and because I'm sort of you know a mill worker and furniture maker and still love the craft of making things, I've always had this thought of, well, is this going to disappear when we go this way? And I think there's there's two things that I think about that. One is that if we make things less expensive here, we have more money to invest in the heirloom things here that, that, that are the craft side of things. Mm -hmm. But I had this experience recently of, of um, 
I went to this little workshop at Inform, which is a furniture store in Vancouver, and they hosted this Japanese um, spoon maker. And he, this is one of these kind of master craftsmen that spends his entire life just making spoons. And so for about an hour, I whittled this thing away to make my spoon. We each got to try one, and mine was awful. And he came by and he picked up this piece of wood, and literally six strokes, he had this beautiful spoon. And I'd spent an hour on mine, right? So, uh, and then he and I started talking, and he said, you know, I can make one in 10 minutes, I can make a really great spoon. And I have to know how long it takes to make a spoon, because this is how I make my living. Mm -hmm. So he's a master craftsman, but he had really been able to calculate the number of strokes, the amount of energy, how often he had to, to sharpen his knife mm -hmm. in order to produce a certain amount an hour to be able to have his craftsmanship actually realized. And that made me think a lot about what we're doing right now with Katera, where we are looking, using big data to understand the cost of everything. Mm -hmm. So that when we design things, we know exactly what it costs before we finish the design, which is currently not possible in our market. And even craft kind of can be understood in that way, which means that the more we understand it, the more we'll actually be able to use it. The more we identify the actual cost of craft, the more I think we'll actually use craft. And because right now, the risk of using craft in building is so high because we mm. can't predict the cost of it. And so I think there's actually a kind of overlap that's going to happen between craft and, and mass production that'll be interesting. So um, just to dig into that a little further, so in, by reducing the costs and, and maybe timelines of, of massive amounts of the building stock, that opens up space for yeah. different kinds of engagement that maybe we just couldn't do otherwise. Is that right? Or are you saying that the actual yeah. transformation is a, is a transformation in the craft uh, sort of tradition? in terms of increasing yeah, I think, efficiency I, I of making this I think realistically spoon. when you design something, you're trying to understand for a client, you're trying to understand the cost of it. And if you don't mm -hmm. know the cost of things, or you can't predict the cost of things, it's a risk. And so you kind of lean towards the things you know or that the contractor knows. Right now the contractor holds the key often to the cost of things. Mm -hmm. And I think craft gets left on the side. But I think with big data, you're going to see this whole new way of talking about the costs of things. So, so let me try to back up and tell the story I was going to tell you guys. So I, I bought a car recently. My car is a 30-year-old car, and I thought I should buy a new car. And, and uh, so I went down to the dealer, and um, by coincidence, the, 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 one of the designers for the car was there at the dealership, and he walked me through the car, and he's like, look, you can get these features and this feature, and we're adding this feature in the future and that feature. And, and so I said, great, and I bought this car. And, the, and the, the, the dealer said, or the, the salesman said, well, listen, because of all these features that you want, I won't be able to tell you the cost of your new car for three more years. <laughs> of course, this isn't a true story. It doesn't happen like this for any other industry other than building. This is exactly what we put our clients through, right? This is exactly what we've been doing in our industry forever. And our clients don't trust us. They don't know what things cost because we say, here's your design, and I'll tell you what it costs three years later. Who does that? We wouldn't buy anything. Would anybody buy a car not knowing what its cost is? Or a computer or anything, the chair you're sitting on? No, we know the cost of everything except for buildings. And because of that, our industry's baked in so much risk into the process that we as designers don't actually get to make choices of whether we go with something that's craft or something that's prefabricated or a blending of those two things because we actually don't have enough knowledge. And I think what's, what's well, I, I know now through the design tools we're developing, which will come out in the next little while, um, everything you draw with actually has a cost attached to it. And so whether you're drawing a plumbing part that you know exactly what the cost is, the shipping cost, the original raw material cost, the labor ins installation cost, the labor installation cost in that specific location, all of that's big data. And so what our industry's never seen before is, is a company that frankly has enough money to harness the big data and, and put that into the system to be able to actually know whether you're building in Toronto or Salt Lake or Vancouver, what the exact cost of construction is as you draw. So when you go and buy a computer and you see in the top screen, you add features and you can see the cost of that computer changing, the software we're working on does that for building design. That's a game changer for us. Because now, if you know what that cost is, including the cost of the craftsmanship piece, you can make a conscious decision in advance 
and hopefully spend your money in a lot more productive way than we currently do. Because right now we spend a huge percentage of what our design is just absorbing risk, not real value. Does that make sense? So massive transformations if the building industry does um, get on board because the, the industry with the size that you've presented it is, uh, is putting a lot of people to work in different ways that are clearly not fully efficient, but there's just a lot of stuff happening. The streamline model with the robots is going to basically fix certain problems, but po possibly create, create others. Create others, and, for sure. And, and architects sort of in, I mean, you're, you're such a good example of an architect who's using design to capture the imagination of clients and, 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 and the industry um, and take, take us in a new direction. Um, but we don't always know what that will look like for for all of us. So we're basically saying, okay, here's a giant it's, chunk of the economy, yep. and we're it's automating pretty, that. Yeah, um, it's, the, it's the issue of AI, right? So mm -hmm. what is AI ultimately going to do to the industry of design mm -hmm. and to the industry of construction? And what what is and will happen is much like Amazon has completely tr transformed the entire retail marketplace, mm -hmm. originally in the U.S. and now globally, so that every company is kind of changing their structure in order to compete with Amazon. The same will be true with how construction works. And it's scary, it's actually really mm -hmm. scary. And the impact on architects, I think, is scary. But the way I look at it is this, is that, you know, I don't know what percentage, let's say 99.5% of houses in Canada are not designed by architects. There's a reason for that, yeah. right? Right. What if we freed up more designers to actually be involved in more of the process of designing houses um, simply by virtue of not needing those same architects to be designing highly repetitive, you know, residential tower systems that actually could be the same in most towers, right? There's, it's, it's, there's opportunity there, I guess, mm -hmm. is the point in the change, but the change is scary. When I looked at Katera, to be honest with you, it's a big, scary thing, right? A $3 billion company that's got huge tech power behind it that's trying to look at our industry and will, in two years, probably be the biggest contractor in North America. It, it, like a five-year-old company, that's, that's like Amazon. That's that level of change. And I looked at it and I thought, well, and they made me this, I'd been advising them, and, and they made me this sort of offer to get more involved with them. And I realized I'd much rather be on the inside of the change that's coming looking out than the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. And for me, I see a responsibility that design is protected in this, and, and, and that the reason they wanted us involved is that design would remain protected as part of this change. And not just get gobbled up by, by those forces. By letting the computer basically right, take right, over. Right. You know, when I look at the skyline of Vancouver, the truth is it's, it's an algorithm for the most part. You, you, you could design most, don't, is there anybody that's the tall building built designer in Vancouver here in the room? My apologies if you hear me say this, but the truth is most of the tall buildings in Vancouver could be designed by a computer mm -hmm. because they're following zoning regulations and community guidelines and curtain wall playbook and um, you know developer kit of rules you put those rules into a computer the architect doesn't have a lot of role anymore right so is that is that good or bad it, it says a lot about what we're doing it mm -hmm. says that we could probably apply our our design resources in a much better way and make a bigger impact on society as we should i'm going to pause for a second because i want to make sure we have some time for questions raise your hand if you have a question in your in mind right now or if you think you will have in the next uh Two or three minutes. Okay. Um, I have lots more questions, but I think maybe, uh, well, I'm just going to mention one thing from the tour. Um, the um, Aaron from the Carpenters Union was explaining the process of one of the buildings that we visited and just how amazed really everyone was at these large pieces of prefabricated mass timber showing up and being assembled in timelines that were just totally inconceivable yeah. uh, even a few years ago. Super fun. <laughs> um, and sort of the scariness of that for a labor union thinking, okay, f five, uh, five guys can put this building together that used to take 50 or whatever the number was. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. But also the sort of stance that they're taking, which is how do we engage with this and, uh, yeah. and work with it? So um, I'm just so interested in how Wood shows up in all of the, in this conversation, because we can kind of keep going down this 
the, the, the AI future, but yeah. would, here it is, it keeps showing up, it's visual, <coughs> so it you, keeps telling a story about yeah. the forest, it keeps asking us questions about where did this come from, um, and, and how much do we need, and what's the impact on the forest, and what's the impact on people. Somehow it's, it has a voice, even amidst some things that might all, seem very cold. These, yeah, absolutely. So on your Carpenters Union thing, I think it's interesting. In New York City, one of the challenges with mass timber is the Carpenters Union is very strong. The, until fairly recently in New York City, um, the Carpenters had complete control over formwork being only built on site. So there'd be no off-site formwork. And so the Carpenters were doing the majority of that work. I always come back to if you're using wood to build concrete formwork and then throwing away a lot of that wood versus yeah. building mass timber where you're actually keeping that wood, right. not only is it a better carbon story, it's a more beautiful building story. And if you're a carpenter, you're building something yeah. with permanence, right? That's right. But shifting the labor union in New York to understanding that takes a little bit of time. And so, you know, Ontario and Toronto, what's happening here is game changing that the industry is embracing it and they have a really cool I got to go and, and speak there and they have a great training center for the students and I understand one of the projects we saw they had built a mm -hmm. chunk of it in there and there's like huge enthusiasm within the community the hard thing in any of these kind of forums is that there's so many threads we could be taking right now around wood right so I'm like all I think because I'm gonna do this talk on on the profession more tomorrow i'm probably gear, gearing some of this conversation that way but we could spend a lot of time just on the sustainability side mm -hmm. on the forestry side um, some really interesting issues happening in the forests in north america and where the opportunities lie around this material um, <clears throat> on regionalism on regionally specific architecture those are all threads on a lot of really cool science coming out now on on the impact of how quickly students learn in wood environments mm -hmm. i love that or how people heal quicker in wood environments all of these are wonderful threads and in the beginning you mentioned that we have um we have a school called dbr design build research and um, one of the programs thanks to ontario actually we have a big grant from ontario one of the programs we have that hopefully all of you guys can engage in is we're developing a program called TOE, Timber Online Education. And it's free, global, translated into 30 different languages, online education in the full spectrum of issues that you could talk about with respect to wood. And it tackles the full spectrum of the industry. So it's not just for designers and architects, it covers contractors, fabric, wood fabricators and innovators, it covers fire departments and regulators. Um, it, co it covers foresters and environmentalists, and it sort of is a series of very in-depth, high-level mm -hmm. to very in-depth courses that hopefully make a much more robust global solution around this and becomes the sort of central resource for sharing. Because you, if you tour, if you're part of the tours or tomorrow, what you'll find is there's amazing stories of, of good things and mistakes, because we all make lots of mistakes, that we need to find better tools to share mm -hmm. that knowledge in order to propel and grow the industry. And so in a couple of years, hopefully you guys will be able to take these courses if you're interested in, and eventually it'll cover everything from, you know, regional issues in Africa to, uh, to Brazil to, you know, how to select FSC certified wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, quick time check, because you said your flight was delayed. Are you, how confident are you know, in what your... What time is it? It is uh, 5 after 7.30. I'm getting picked seven. up at 7.30. Okay, that's great. So that, that buys us some, a little extra conversation okay. time. Yeah, um, the audience is up for it. Though. Yeah, so tomorrow there's going to be, um, among the panels, there's one on global forest partnerships, cool. supply chain, um, urban environment. So all those kinds of themes are going to be uh, well explored. Great. So that's going to be great. So let's, um, let's open it up to the floor and keep the conversation going. Um, who would like to start? And is there, are there some assistants with mics that can uh, run over and reach? Okay, I see uh, Lee Fox uh, with a question. Hey, good. Um, my name is Lee. I'm a 20-year tree planter out of BC. Uh, nice. I've been planting in Africa for 15 years, so here to talk, I guess, particularly about the supply side of it, and uh, wondering how, like, if you guys are building the biggest factory in North America, um, what does your wood supply side look like? And just curious if you know what kind of volumes are going to go through there, but also specifically to BC. 203 indigenous nations there, and uh, one, maybe two treaties signed with the government, so all on unceded land, 
traditional knowledge and traditional territory in forestry is a very important topic uh, in the discussion and how how does that factor into your supply chain, I guess, is uh, if you could talk to that. So it's a little different no south of the border than north. So we work with Ecotrust. So, so the new plant for Katera is in uh, Spokane in, in eastern Washington. That's where it is. Most of the sourcing will likely come out of BC. Um, some from First Nation, some from Central BC, non-First Nation. Um, in the States, we were with Ecotrust in Portland who um, have a really good program working with First Nations communities that um, have small, smaller scale forest supplies. And so we've been really trying to, to not only pursue an FSC solution as well as FSC indigenous um, forest kind of solutions in, in, as far as the supply chain in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in BC, We've talked to and have been trying to encourage, in particular the Squamish Nation, we've been really interested in looking at doing a CLT fabrication on, on, um, for themselves. And Haida Gwaii has also looked at it before. So there are nations that are looking at um, how they can take control of, of add value adding on their own land. Um, it's not happening yet, but I'd love to see it happen for sure. Yeah. Um, Volume-wise, what we're going to do in the in the plant, I'm not actually clear. I, um, I should probably know that stat, but I don't, I don't actually know it offhand. Um, we're going to, the next year, we're going to feed into our own projects, and eventually we'll be feeding other supply chains. So it'll be pretty large volume for sure. Is there a specific type of wood? <laughs> mostly, it's mostly SPF, so spruce pine fir. Um, you can work in glue lamb. Um, we should be developing hemlock because hemlock in BC in particular doesn't have a lot of usefulness um, in, the tip of, in the traditional construction market and there's a lot of hemlock. It's a weaker species so there's some issues with it but, um, but um, yeah, on the coast in Oregon they're making dug, dug fir CLT and to me that's a, too much of a premium wood. The, one of the beauties of CLT in general is you can use lower grade wood, you can bury bury the bad wood in the middle, not the bad wood, but lesser, lesser mm -hmm. aesthetic wood in the middle and so forth. So there's an efficiency of using the, the um, um, using all of the resource in, in a CLT solution. Um, but most panels are sp spruce pine fir. Um, and if you're an architect in the room, it's important to learn about this stuff because you'll see otherwise your glue lamb will be one species and your CLT will be another species and the colors will be totally different. And worse yet, over time, the, the impact of ultraviolet light will really start to deviate the two materials unless you learn about coatings. And there's a lot of technical stuff to know about the wood. Um, um, thank you. Um, but just to, just to add a little uh, extra dimension to that, it's interesting how the conversation about the um, emerging technologies kind of loops back to um, our greater interest in indigenous knowledge, a greater uh, at attempt at least to restore some of those relationships and you know you sort of think about this greater and greater level of technology driving the industry and then how that helps us with with uh, with a goal of mm -hmm. integrating and um, including indigenous culture's participation in this industry. So a really interesting challenge for, for these values. Mm -hmm. And when you, I'm sorry that my, um, if my acknowledgement sounded stilted, but it was very heartfelt, even though I was reading it, because I mean, this is, you know, that, that's out there now. We're really starting to see how can we do that better. Yeah, um, it was, I, I like hearing that because in BC, that's what we do. We, we mm -hmm. start every event by yeah. acknowledging the people whose land we're on. Um, but I haven't heard that in Ontario, so it's nice to hear that today. Yeah. Is that normal out here? Sorry to ask. It is for the University of <laughs> yeah. Toronto now, yeah, and That's I don't good. know when that came really into um, policy. So um, um, the, the one last thing, just as kind of riffing off that, is um, you really see in Europe uh, um, the circular economy happening around <clears throat> value add in, in mm -hmm. um, value added products, and so CLT plants in Aust Austria, for instance, and there are many will allow a town to be completely off-grid. So you imagine with a lot of our Na First Nations communities that are more remote, effectively they're, you know, they've got a biomass um, energy plant, the sawdust off of um, the mill and then off the CLT plant effectively is po powering the entire community. Um, creating jobs, keeping everybody local, there's a huge amount of reason for us and for the federal government to get really involved in encouraging that across Canada. 
Um, so we have regional supplies feeding this concept from all of our forests coast to coast. Next question. <laughs> Paul. Um, Let me that microphone here. Wait, can you say it with the mic? Yeah. Uh, how does uh, hardwood uh, factor Hard. in? It's a very big resource in North America, but it's a huge resource in Latin America and Central America, not to mention them. Africa and so on. So how does that play in, in this uh, wood revolution? So hardwoods are found a lot into laminated veneer lumber, laminated <laughs> strand lumber. Strand lumber, um, which is a pretty, it's a pretty clever resource. It has a high percentage of glue, which I personally don't love, but it's, it's taking, it can take very small di diameter trees. It can take um, I think ultimately it can take branches. It can take like effectively the whole tree. Um, and those are typically a hardwoods for so the maple, aspen, um, trees like that. So certain hardwoods. In Central America, South America, um, similar opportunities for sure towards engineered products. Um, there's a lot of softwoods in, South, in, in the Brazilian basin, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, mostly not so much Argentina, but Chile. That's a lot of softwood production, and now there's CLT production starting to happen in Chile, for example. And I think, and there's talk, and we've been working with a group called Amada, who are an FSC certified forester in Brazil, um, and their intention is to bring CLT to Brazil, which I think will be a really good thing because it'll start to encourage reforestation and change the value of um, the forest, which is a huge part of the solution. Just a quick addendum to the question is: so where does this show up in the building, though? Other than small decorative Well, so LVL, so a couple of projects I showed were, so the city hall project I showed in North Vancouver, that's made of LSL. So that's made out of, in that case, it was uh, red maple. Um, so that's a hardwood. In um, the case of the LVL, it's often um, eastern, either Maine or Ontario. Um, actually, uh, North Vancouver is made out of red maple from Ontario. Um, hmm. So that project and that LVL project, which was the one that was built inside of the other space, um, those are both Canadian Eastern hardwoods. That's an example and as an engineered hardwood product. Lars, in the front row. So according to statistics from OECD, 1.3 million people move into cities per day globally. Most of that urbanization is happening in developing countries. Do you see any opportunity to meet the need for shelter of those people from wooden buildings? Yes. So. Um and I'd, I'd say that for me personally, that was the first big motivator as I started to think about the urban scale issues. I mean, it's interesting in North America, but it's not important, or it's not as important as dealing with it in other countries. And especially around climate, it's, if we're gonna actually treat this as a climate device, we need to actually think about it in developing countries where the volume is. So um, in India, so Katera is working in India. The problem in India is the relationship of the forest. They have a huge forest, but they have this very um, archaic kind of management system there. Um, and so unfortunately, a lot of the housing is being built out of prefabricated concrete now. And um, we're hoping in India that we can kind of start to work with the government and change that as an example of a place that could do that. Um, we do a lot of work outside of this in high mountain cultures, so in northern Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, often it's stone. But in high mountain cultures, they build also in wood. It's their tradition. So, um, but you don't see that it's not highly urbanized, so we're not yet into using these kinds of solutions in those, in those environments. Um, I think um, the, the place I'm probably most concerned about is Africa and how this rolls out in Africa. Um, Africa, as you probably know, um, the big wood use in Africa is for fuel. It's, it's for burning for um, um, for Critical. for cooking, yeah. and um, and so that's um, how that how this competes with that um, is a big question that I don't fully understand yet. 
Um, but I think in a lot of places in the world it could. Indonesia um, certainly could. The trick in some places, obviously, is how they manage the forest and if, if they understand the balance of forest management with this as a solution. So Indonesia would be a good example of that, where they don't have a great history with forest management issues. The reason that wood at work exists is really trying to put those pieces together, is that if we're thinking about this volume of wood, and to Lars's point, if you think about the, just the amount of the square footage um, and cubic meters of wood needed to house people, where are the forests going to be? Right. And you know, Austria is not going to be supplying all of, uh, of Africa in their housing needs. Austria is, some of you know this, but the big supplier of CLT um, products up until recently when Canada started to really step up. And, but uh, still, uh, still are the these biggest, forests, think, yeah. it's still the biggest producer yeah, yeah. by volume. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. That relatively small country able yeah. to do that. But um, if you just think of the, even the mega cities in Africa right now and the spe speed of growth, um, where is that wood going to come from? I mean, I'm not sure we can answer that right now, but just the... Afri Africa, I'm really, I, like, as I said, I'm not sure of. South America, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think that we'll see actually reforestation of land or afforestation. So taking land that's been cleared for agriculture, mm -hmm. turning it back into forest, I think we'll see a huge incentive for that yeah. in South America. Africa, I'm not sure how it'll work. Well, Lee, Lee will tell us about that tomorrow because that's what he's working on. Another Perfect. question from, from the floor. Well, I have the microphone. Yeah. So, so, uh, <laughs> as a forester, I'm not at all worried about the water being supplied for this building process. But when I go to Sao Paulo, I see Mediterranean-style concrete buildings. I don't see in any of these places any tradition to build major buildings in wood. My concern would the architecture be there. Will, will the concrete industry sabotage it, or will the corruption make sure that it takes 10 years to get the permit that you need, and will the planning work and all that? But the, the, the woods will be, the tree will be there. The, yeah. the concern is elsewhere. So um, just to the point of Brazil, so um, w with our school, that's what we're doing. We're rolling out a program with the architecture schools in Brazil to create competitions, to get students interested in it, to create, to work with the architectural associations to re reinvigorate interest in it. But you're right, in, in non-traditional cultures where they're not used to building in wood, um, of course, Brazil used to be, they just lost it for the last hundred years. I think it's no different than here. I mean, for me to get to come here and see in Toronto wood buildings going up, it just, it made my day today to see that because you know, my sense in Canada, who we are a wood culture. Mm -hmm. We are coast to coast. I designed Ottawa Airport, if you ever go to Ottawa. In the first phase of Ottawa, I was pretty young and I'm not super proud of. Um, but, but the steel structure was supposed to be a wood structure. And the airport authority said, oh, you just want that because you're from B.C. And I said, no, I'm, from, I'm actually from Ottawa. I grew up mostly in Ottawa. And Ottawa used to be a timber town before it was our nation's capital. But why has everybody forgotten this, right? We are a timber culture in Canada, coast to coast to coast. And, and the, the, the problem is modernism taught architects mm -hmm. that this was a material of the past. Mm -hmm. And that's true globally. And, you know, the international style and globalization has meant that, you know, every major city in the world looks the same and kind of looks like concrete Vancouver or Toronto. Mm -hmm. We as a nation should be proud of our identity as, as a timber culture. Look at the Scandinavians. So for, I've given up, but for year after year after year, I go to the Venice Biennale and I wanted to do, I would always apply to tell the story of wood culture, the Canadian wood culture. Never once were we ever considered to do the Venice Biennale. And instead, the story was almost like we as a culture were ashamed of our identity. You know, wood was dumped in with beavers and mounties or something. The Scandinavians didn't do that. We as a country, coast to coast, and here in Toronto, the fact that wood's back is unbelievable. And now we re-embrace our identity as a nation and then lead the world, right? And share this mm -hmm. knowledge around the world. That's our, that's our responsibility as a wealthy nation. Um, uh, there's a question in the front row. There's a few in the back as well. So let's, uh, let's keep them moving so we can get a few more in before Michael has to leave. I was curious. Sound check. I was curious about your thoughts about 
the Silicon Valley culture coming into the construction industry, you know. You see Uber just bulldozing towns, you see sidewalk coming in and having huge fights, some cultural battles here, and coming in to revolutionize the industry. But as you said, only a third of it is the value of the building. A third of it is that whole regulatory slog. Uh, a lot of the building cost is below grade in the foundations that you never have a full handle on. Um, I really, do you think that Silicon Valley mindset can actually change an industry like construction that is so entrenched in the problems of bureaucracy and approval and the endless slog? Yeah, I do. And, and I don't know if you had asked me that six years ago, would I have said that? I don't know. But right now, I do think that Silicon Valley, the one thing that I admire about the folks I work with from, from Google, Microsoft, Katera, Facebook, whoever, is that they don't see roadblocks at all. They just don't see them. If there's a regulatory problem, just hire people that'll fix it. And that's kind of their attitude. Yes, and we didn't see the problems when we graduated either. And then they just got beaten down for 20 years. You don't think that's going to happen to them? Well, so the only thing, I guess personally, my, my just personal experience is that, you know, I wrote the case for Tallwood Buildings first in like 2010 or something, and it got published in 2012. And at the time, people thought I was crazy. When I gave my TED mm -hmm. talk in 2013, people thought this was a stupid idea. And half of my audience for my TED talk were the same Silicon Valley guys that are now dumping hundreds of millions of dollars into these ideas. That's how quick things change. The building code in China changed last a year ago, but a year ago now to allow 18-story tall wood buildings. You know, Canada's changing our building code. The United States is changing their building code. All of these were things I was told were never going to happen. Or if they were, they were going to take 20 years to happen. They've already happened, right? All these things have already happened in really six years. Um, so my personal experience is I'm blown away. I can't believe it. I, this thing is just... You know, I mean, I get calls from all over the world by architects or clients that want to build in this way or learn more about it or countries that want to create, you know, education programs to allow for it. It's very exciting and it definitely makes me believe that change is possible. Is there a question in the back there? Yeah, my name is Paul. I'm actually an undergrad student here. Great. I was one of those people, I think, a few years ago that was very skeptical of the wooden construction. My first question is, you know Macmillan Bloedel, like the big BC wood manufacturing company that's gone overseas now? Are you aware of it or no? Yeah, Did, I know. Yeah. I, know. Well, I don't know where you are. Where, where's your oh, name? I'm here. So sorry. I don't know where to look. Oh, there you are. But you know the big British, sorry, the BC-based manufacturing company that's gone everything I, to Europe now? Yeah, I don't even know if Mac Blow's owned it, but it is even BC anywhere. I think it's a US own. Does it even exist exactly as it did? I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's, you've talked a lot about the, the connotation forestry has with Canada and the rich industry we have in wood and the traditional learning. But now with so much investment from the United States and interest in Silicon Valley, I was really curious about what you think forestry in Canada will look like in the next few decades, especially when you look at the track record of Canadian companies going south, like you have RIM, you have Nortel, or they move out. I was right. curious like, if you have yeah. a deep relationship with the country and what that will look like. Yeah, so I mean, I had some concerns about Katera in general, right, because they're a US company, and I thought a lot about this as an issue, but I also recognize that we don't have anybody that's going to be able to put the money into this change anytime soon. But it is a bit scary, right? This is, they're going to be Amazon, and it's going to be a little scary what that means for Canadian companies. Um, so investment in Canada is something that I'm really working to encourage with the Katera folks and how they do it. Um, I think um, with forestry, um, first of all, I'd say this. Canada still has to improve the way we forest. We're not, to me, we're pretty good, but we have a ways to go. Um, I'm not a big fan of the scale of the clear cuts we do. I'd really like to see us go with a California smaller scale clear cut system. So we need to improve as a nation in the way we do things still. Although we're good, we need to get better. Um, as far as our companies go, um, a lot of our big forestry companies in BC have gone down and invested in U.S. forests and are big investors in U.S. forests. So Interfor, Canfor, those are big BC companies, Canadian-owned BC companies that own huge huge portions of U.S. forest. And they did that because of binational softwood. They did that so they had a foothold in both countries. And, um, 
And I think they were really smart, and I think that's good for Canada. And I, you know, I advocated with you, the, the Canadian Senate, they have this committee on forestry, and one of the kind of rolled out these sort of 10 things we should do as a country to, to promote forestry in general. And one of them was that our forestry companies should invest in Uruguay and Brazil and bring va good values, but also mm -hmm. take business <clears throat> understanding and encouragement into other countries. That, that's reasonable for us to do, not just lose our forests, but engage in others. So I think we're pretty much out of time. I want to make sure you get out the door. It's the uh, it's the 7:30 mark. You want to hit right. Mm -hmm. um, so before we say goodbye, just to just to sum up some um, I think some great thoughts. The one is the kind of almost inevitability of the transformations that are happening and how we can play architects can play a positive role in in steering that. Um, questions about the potential conflicts between certain cultural values and and if we just use the indigenous culture as one example and some of these changes and how we navigate that partnering with people to make sure that those are uh, beneficial um, questions about how industry um, as it takes a greater and greater role in things that may have been um, smaller scale um, mm -hmm. what happens and so there's a lot of opportunity and not just opportunity but importance of leadership <coughs> and architects and uh, foresters and people in any part of this industry, I think I would just say are desperately needed to be leaders in helping to I shape agree. and steer this and have those values in mind so that we're co-creating something that we actually can look back on once it's done to say, we're glad this happened, not like, oh yeah. crap, yeah. what have we done and why were we sitting here on this stage uh, 15 years ago, having this conversation and not seeing this coming. Right. So um, I really want to thank you. This has been an incredibly uh, dynamic start to our event. Um, and I'm going to make a few announcements, but I, I feel like you should maybe just like go make the make the run um, to your car. And Phone's thank you so ringing. much for taking the time to be with us. It's yeah. just been great to have you here, Michael.